Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Drawing to Learn production on the muscles of the back by myself and Associate Professor Doa Alansri. Specifically, this video constitutes the pre-class component or activity that should follow on in your laboratory packages, which steps you through how to learn the muscle groups of the intrinsic back muscles, starting from deep to superficial. We will be starting with the transversospinalis muscle group first, followed then by the erector spinae and then the splenius muscles. We will also be covering their individual components and their primary actions. We will then finish with the intermediate muscles that aid in respiration, being the serratus posterior muscles. Throughout this video, we will be providing origin and insertion tables to purely assist you with visualizing the location, course and anatomical relations in order to work out and remember their actions and functions. We expect you to remember the general origins and insertions for each muscle group, their action and nerve supply. We'll now start by considering the transversospinalis muscle group, the deepermost muscle group in the back region. These muscles generally go from the transverse process up to the spinous process. So they are angled obliquely, going upwards and medially. The rotatories generally span one to two segments and are most specifically seen in the thoracic region where rotation is the prime movement. So we have the ability of each segment to rotate on the other to produce a large amount of rotation. They are present also in the lumbar spine and can sometimes be defined in the literature as deep multifidus and they're also present in the cervical region. The multifidus is best seen in the lumbar region and spans two to five segments. The semispinalis is best seen in the cervical region and it starts in the thoracic and moves up to insert either on the cervical spine or on the occiput. Semispinalis spans five to nine segments. The collective action of this muscle group when they work bilaterally on both sides is extension of the region that they're in. So extension of the cervical spine or of the vertebral column if they're in the thoracic or lumbar region. When they work unilaterally on one side, they will ipsilaterally laterally flex or side bend to the same side or contralaterally rotate. Their nerve supply is the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves. We will now commence our drawing with the rotatories part or component of the transversospinal script. So as mentioned before, this muscle group generally originates from the transverse process and moves up to the spinous. The rotatories starts from the transverse process of C1 to L5 to insert on the vertebra above. They're unisegmental or they may pass two segments. So rotatories, generally speaking, passes one to two segments. Best seen in the thoracic region where unisegmental movement is important or unisegmental rotation is important. Because they have an origin and insertion that's close to the joints and they're quite short, they're also known as the stabilizers. And the latest research has shown that they tend to stabilize the vertebral column during large sagittal or coronal movements where the erector spine is the prime mover. So during flexion, during extension, uh, during lateral flexion. But if the main movement is more of a rotatory movement, they can be the prime movement. So you can see they're quite short origin and insertion close to the joints. And so they have a greater transarticular component. So they're known as a shunt muscle that improves the stabilization across the joint space. All right, we now move on to the multifidus. The multifidus again is another component of the transversospinalis group that spans two to five segments and best seen in the lumbar region. If we look at the lumborum, we'll start with that one. It starts on the mammillary processes of the lumbar five, the posterior sacrum, and the posterior superior iliac spine. 
to insert on the lateral aspect and tips of the spinous processes of vertebra two to five levels above, above its origin. So if it's in the lumbar region, starting off at the sacrum, it will go up to L2. In the cervical region, it passes from the superior articular processes of C4 to C7, and then again goes up to insert on the spinous processes of the vertebra two to five levels above the origin, again moving obliquely. In the thoracic region, passes from the transverse processes of the thoracic vertebra to again move up to two to five segments above where it originates. So they're quite long, the fascicle lengths. Collectively as a group, if they contract again, they will extend the lumbar spine, thoracic or cervical spine, ipsilaterally laterally flex or contralaterally rotate. The semispinalis group is best depicted in the cervical region. We start off with the deep most uh, part of this muscle will be the cervicus. The origin is transverse processes of T1 to T6 up to the spinous processes of C2 to C5. We now look at the semispinalis capitis as its name suggests the origin starts on the caput or the head, on the nuchal crest, and the insertion is on the spinous processes of C2, T4, or the articular fillers in that region. This muscle can be seen in a dissection quite well in between the two splenii muscles, splenius cervicus and splenius capitis. So collectively, the semispinalis group span five to nine segments. Generally speaking, their origin starts in either in the mid region uh, of the thoracic area or the upper thoracic area. They will span up to the head or to the neck. This allows the head and neck to move into rotation and side flexion, and they almost act like stirrups of a horse to guide the rotatory movement. If you can imagine if all the muscles originated in the neck and finished in the neck for the cervical spine, we'd have a very thick neck. So it's good to have some of those muscles originating from the thoracic region. The semispinalis thoracis originates on the transverse processes of T6 to T10 and goes up to the spinous processes of C6 to T4. This muscle again highlights the intimate connection between the thorax and the cervical spine. To summarize, the transversospinalis grip consists of three parts, the rotatories, the multipedis and the semispinalis. They generally start on the transverse process as their name suggests and finish on the spinous processes of the regions that they're associated with. Their main action is rotation and they also act to extend. So during rotatory movements, they are the prime movers. And during extension or large movements of the vertebral column, they tend to be the stabilizers. We're now going to start drawing the erector spiny group. And as the muscle name suggests, these muscles erect the spine. So you can deduce from that that they, their prime movement will be extension. The erector spiny can be divided into the iliocostalis, the longissimus and the spinalis. So if we look at their order going from one through to three, they're lateral to medial. In addition to the action of extension, they also laterally flex to the same side or ipsilaterally and rotate to the same side or ipsilaterally. And collectively they are supplied by the dorsal rami of the spinal nerves. So now let's start by drawing the iliocostalis. And as its name suggests, this muscle spans from the iliac crest and generally speaking goes up to the angles of the ribs. So more specifically, the iliocostalis lumborum, so the second name of the muscle refers to the region that it's in, in the lumbar region spans from the lateral crest of the sacrum 
the medial iliac crest and the thoracolumbar fascia. To insert on the angle of the ribs, five to 12, and the transverse processes of L1 to L4. In the thoracic region, the muscle spans from the angle of the ribs, seven to 12, to insert on the angles of the ribs of one to six, and the transverse process of C7. As the addition of the uppermost part of this muscle is put on the diagram. You will note that the erector spiny are quite thin in the cervical region compared to the transverse spinalis grip, which again indicates that one of the prime movements in the cervical spine is more combined movements of lateral flexion and rotation. The final band of the iliocostalis is the iliocostalis cervicus, which passes from the angle of ribs three to six to insert onto the transverse processes of C4 to C6. The longissimus is the middle band of erector spiny and generally commences on the median sacral crest, the posterior sacrum and the posterior iliac crest to insert onto the transverse processes of L1 to L5 for the lumbar part. And then for the thoracic part, it will start on the spinous and transverse processes of L1 to L5, move up to the transverse processes of T1 to T12. So it's a muscle that generally attaches along the transverse processes all the way up to T. So now we look at the cervicus part, takes its origin from the transverse processes of T1 to T5 to insert on the transverse processes of C2 to C6. As it attaches also to the head, it will have a capitus part, longissimus capitus, takes its origin from the transverse processes of C4 to T5 up to the mastoid process. So again, as you can see, the longissimus is quite a small muscular band that connects the thoracic to the cervical to the occiput in the cervical region. The most medial band of the erector spiny is the spinalis, and as its name suggests, runs along the spinous processes. Again, it's named according to its regional location. So there is a spinalis thoracis, which takes its origin from the spinous processes of T11 to L2 to insert on the spinous processes of T2 to T8. This muscle is quite tenderness and is integrated with the supraspinous ligament and the deeper interspinalis ligaments. The cervicus part takes its origin from the spinous processes of C7 to T1 to insert on the spinous processes of C2 to C4. And so you can see it's very close to the spine. Being quite parallel with long fascicles, it produces a large movement of extension, unilateral rotation and lateral flexion when it contracts ipsilaterally or on the same side. The last part of the spinalis attaches to the caput or to the head, takes its origin from C7 to T1 to insert onto the occipital bone. So just going over the parts of the erector spiny, if we move from lateral to medial, we start off with the muscles that are indicated in orange, the iliocostalis, which runs from the ilium up to the angles of the ribs. The middle band, which is longissimus, as indicated in red, which takes its origin again from the thoracolumbar fascia, sacrum, and the posterior iliac crest, and inserts along the transverse processes. And finally, the medial band, which is the spinalis, which runs along the spinous processes. Collectively, they are the erector spine. The muscles in the intermediate layer of the back are the serratus posterior superior and the serratus posterior inferior. These are present in 30% of the population. 
and they're thought to be accessory muscles of respiration because of their attachments to the ribs. So if we start off looking at the serratus posterior superior, it originates from the spinous processes of C7 to T3 and the ligamentum nuci to insert on ribs two to five on the posterior aspect. So these muscles sit in the intermediate layer above the erector spinae and also the transverso spinalis group. The serratus posterior superior is thought to elevate the ribs during inspiration and the serratus posterior inferior is thought to depress the ribs during expiration. The serratus posterior inferior originates from the spinous processes of T12 to L3 and originates on ribs 9 to 12 on the posterior aspects. As they are accessory muscles of respiration, they can become overactive in people with obstructive lung disease, respiratory disease, where the diaphragm becomes incompetent. And so these muscles are used to assist in the action of respiration. And that's why this disease population can sometimes experience low back pain because any muscles that attach to the ribs, such as iliocostalis lumborum, thoracis, also longissimus and spinalis, um, and the serratus posterior grip can actually act as accessory muscles of respiration. They also act bilaterally as weak extensors of the vertebral column. Elevation and depression of the ribs is another action that they have. Elevation for the superior and depression for the inferior. So this completes the session on the muscles of the back and the drawings that have resulted from this, going from the deep layers to the more intermediate layers. Above this, you would expect, of course, the latissimus dorsi, the rhomboids, the trapezius and the other muscles in this region. Thanks for joining us and bye for now.